Um, so I will cover um, what we do with the patients who have received uh, first, second, or third generation EGFR inhibitors. Those are my disclosures. So we're gonna go through management of t 790 m mutant lung cancer. I'm gonna show some data on uh, how to determine if your patient is likely to have small cell transformation when they develop recurrence. And then we're gonna look at the resistance uh, patterns for patients who received osimertinib as a first line therapy and how can we potentially combat that versus osimertinib received as a second line therapy. So as uh, was just showed, um, in the patients who are diagnosed with stage four non-small cell lung cancer, who have an EGFR sensitizing mutation, we have established that chemotherapy uh, results in better, uh, the targeted therapy results in better outcome than chemotherapy. And what we expect in that situation, that progression three survival would be anywhere between 10 to 11 months, but eventually all those patients will progress. Once they progress, we know that about 50 to 60 percent of the patients will develop a secondary mutation called T790M. It can happen either alone or together with EGFR amplification, but other potential mechanisms of resistance can happen. For example, BRAF mutation has been described, meta amplification, PI3 kinase mutations, small cell lung cancer transformation, and HER2 amplification. So if you look overall, about 60% of the patients will have T790M, about 20% of patients will have bypass tract, and about 20% of the patients will have a resistance mutations which we can't yet identify. So osimertinib um, is a designer drug that was developed with a four specific criteria in mind. Um, it was developed to inhibit traditional EGFR sensitizing mutation, um, also to inhibit T790M mutation. It was developed not to inhibit EGFR wild type, which is responsible for your toxicity, such as diarrhea and skin rash, and it was also developed uh, to have an excellent CNS penetration. At the bottom, you see is analogous monkey models. On the left um, panel is osimertinib, and um, see how it compares with rosalatinib, which is no longer being developed, as well as gefitinib, which is currently one of the standards of care in patients with newly diagnosed stage four EGFR mutant non-small cell lung cancer. So this is an example of osimertinib second-line trial. So this is trials for the patients who have received first-line EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors and then progressed. In red, this is what we would expect for patients with T790M mechanism of resistance, response rate in the order of 60 to 70 percent, progression-free survival in the order of 9.6 months to 10.1 months. Interestingly enough, in a phase one clinical trial, patients who did not have a T790M mutation were allowed to enter, and we still see a response rate of approximately 21% on PFS of 2.8 months. How many of those patients are the ones who have um, T790M um, ex in existence, but we just can't find it on the tissue? Um, it is not known at this point. So important trial, or three, um, looked at the patients who were, um, had stage four non-small cell lung cancer and received a first or second generation EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Those, th those patients were chemotherapy naive, and upon progression, they were found to have a T790M mutation, and then they got randomized to osimertinib standard dose versus platinum pemetrexate since those patients were platinum naive. And as you can see here, um, osimertinib outperformed platinum pemetrexate um, on many, many levels in uh, time to uh, progression-free survival. Uh, patients with or without CNS metastasis uh, also benefited, and toxicity was, of course, uh, much more plausible in osimertinib patients than platinum chemotherapy. So that, to me, has established osimertinib as the standard of care for patients who have progressed of EGFR TKI via T790M mechanism. So how do you test for T790M mutation? Um, Dr. Ross has already discussed the liquid biopsy. Again, um, I also want to stress that remember that uh, liquid biopsy could be false negative in about 30% of the patients who have a T790M mutation. So if your liquid is negative, then remember to still go for tissue. 
my personal feeling, like if I, um, especially if I look at the liquid biopsy and I can't find an originating EGFR mutation. So your deletion 19 should never go away. So if you do a liquid biopsy and I don't see the deletion 19 and I don't see a T790 M, that makes me think that maybe there is not enough cell-free DNA circulating in the blood. I have a slightly more confidence if I see the deletion 19, but I don't see the T790 M, but still because of the false negative rate of about 30%, I would still recommend and to proceed to biopsy the tissue and test T790M in a tissue. The tissue also can be false negative in about 10% of the patients. So in my practice, I actually do both. Um, I do liquid biopsy, which comes back in about seven to 10 days. I treat off the liquid biopsy if I find T790M mutation. Not forgetting that uh, biopsy for small cell transformation is important because there have been cases reported in the patients with small cell transformation who have a T790M mutation diagnosed on the plasma. So if your patient is progressing rapidly, um, I think don't, and especially if they have um, RB1 mutations and P53 mutations, which I'll show in a second, don't forget to rebiopsy those patients to make sure that they do not have a small cell transformation, which you will treat differently. Uh, you'll give them traditional chemotherapy for small cell lung cancer. Um, this is a flow chart that I find kind of interesting um, from TAN. I'm not going to go through that, but you can look at my slides later. It's basically the questions how you determine what you do with those patients first starts with is, is the rebiopsy feasible or not, and then you just go through the full chart, and if you found a T790M mutation, then the treatment of choice would be osimertinib. Small cell transformation. So we know that in the patients who have um, progressed off first line osimertinib as well as uh, second line osimertinib, about um, different literature says anywhere from two to five percent, they can transform to small cell. But we now know that if at the time of your diagnosis, your patient has an activation of both RB1 as well as P53, that increases your risk of small cell transformation to about 43 times. So commonly, I do next generation sequencing at the time of the diagnosis and um, a lot of um, physicians where I practice um, do next generation sequencing. So that's where you can see on your original next generation sequencing if you have an activation of RB1 and P53. And here you can see that those are patients who actually developed small cell transformation. And you can see that a lot of them has an activation of both um, genes. And then those are patients who did not develop um, small cell transformation. It is also interesting, there was a nice paper by Lee and JCO showing us that clonal diversion to small cell lung cancer actually happens pretty early um, in the disease and um, we don't understand, so they actually need to have um, a separate heat in the upper back, which is a different suppressor gene uh, for the small cell transformation to happen. So um, Dr. Agrawal just showed us the first line osimertinib data, flora, um, just to uh, reiterate, uh, osimertinib outperform um, gifetinib or lotinib based on the progression-free survival. There has not been reported improvement in overall survival because the medians have not been reached. However, the hazard ratio is 0.63 and confidence intervals do not cross the midline and hazard ratio for dacometinib versus gefitinib was also 0.63. So I think my expectation is that eventually um, osimertinib might show overall survival benefit with the uh, time pass, um, uh, as the time pass will be reach median survivals. So osimertinib resistance. Um, so what do I do now with the patients who either received osimertinib first line as per flora data or osimertinib second line after uh, finding that the patient has a T790M mutation um, after receiving uh, first or second generation EGFR inhibitor. So we know that osimertinib resistance is, is complex. Uh, the data is currently emerging um, that you can divide um, osimertinib resistance into two major subgroups. The one that uh, maintain T790M and the one that lose T790M. The one that maintain T790M 
a lot of those patients have a new mutation called C797S, which I'll explain in a second. Um, and patients who lose the T790M, you can see that the re resistance mutations in those patients is a little bit more complex, and you can have metamplifications and um, other bypass pathways. This is a different paper uh, presented in a different format, but kind of the same idea. So if your patient has preserved T790M, then the C779S, which is right here, majority of the C797S happens if you have a preservation of uh, T790M. So that's important information. Um, and also we know that C797S, it's an interesting mutation. So C797 residue, it's where your osimertinib binds. This is the same place where afatinib binds. So when you have a mutation in that residue, you prevent binding of both osimertinib or afatinib to that protein. But your first generation TKIs are actually bound, bind in a different way. So presence of C797S mutation actually does not per, um, lead to resistance to first and second generation EGFR TKI. Another interesting thing, so the C797S can happen on the same allele, which is called cis, or a different allele, which is called trans. So if you have it, what we call now, oops, sorry, um, a triple mutant, patient who has an EGFR sensitizing mutation, T790M and C779S in their, uh, on the same allele, so-called triple mutant, they will be resistant to both first and second generation EGFR mutation. This is all preclinical data basically showing you that if you have a deletion 19 and T790M, this is where osimertinib in the red line, um, it does have efficacy, and then uh, the, uh, the first, uh, the um, if you have a C779S, then um, in a black line, they do not have efficacy. This is a picture showing you the difference between cis and trans. So if you have a triple mutant, they will be resistant to both first and second generation um, EGFR inhibitors. But if you have a trans, so if you have a mutation on a different allele, right here you can see gefitinib is in red. Your um, afatinib is in yellow. So afatinib, since it's bind to the same locus, we expect those patients to be resistant. Uh, Resistant, but if you give both gefitinib and afatinib in the patients who have 797S as trans, at least preclinically, we see some efficacy. So this is what the proposed um, flow chart in the patients who have received osimertinib. So for example, if your patient got osimertinib in, um, in the first line therapy, so if they had deletion 19, they got osimertinib in first line therapy, and they develop C79S, since there is no T790, then for those patients, we can actually attempt to give a first generation T, uh, TKIs because there is no t 790 m mutation, the first generation should be effective. So it is possible that in the future, you know how we now use erlotinib first followed by osimertinib if you have a T790M mutation. It is very possible that we're gonna use osimertinib first and upon resistance, if they develop C797S mutation, we could potentially transfer them to first generation TKIs. And then if you develop, if you uh, gave the patient first generation TKI and then progressed uh, due to t 790 m mutation, then the decision if it's in the same allele versus not the same allele, if it's in a different allele, you can actually try a combination of first generation and third generation EGFR inhibitors. Another thing we also know that the patients who, um, so going back into the second line of osimertinib, so the patients who lose T790M mutation when they become resistant to osimertinib, their uh, outcomes are worse. They have shorter progression-free survival, which has now been shown in, in several data sets. And it's also interesting, um, I like this, this, this graph. So this is basically all the patients who developed resistance to osimertinib from second line trials kind of um, ranked in the time it took for them to progress on osimertinib. So patients who take longer to progress, majority of them develop C797S, but people who progress quickly, the progression is, seems to be by a different mechanism, not including C797S mutation. 
So frontline osimertinib, this is a very limited data to this point. This is a publication uh, from Ramalingam showing that um, we do see 797S uh, mutation in the patients who received osimertinib first line, but other mutations, and we mentioned today KRAS mutations, MEC, um, I personally have um, a, a RET mutation um, as a resistant mechanism to first line osimertinib. So, um, we, this is another example of um, showing you that patients who develop C797S after first line of simertinib will be sensitive to first generation EGFR inhibitor as T790M are not present. This is all preclinical data. Um, we also, when we talk about resistance to osimertinib, I think the same paradigm um, still uh, plays a role uh, dividing our progressing patients into three different progressing types. So you can have a CNS progression where your progression is only in the CNS and you can use local regional um, treatments like radiation to control the CNS progression. You can also have an oligoprogression where uh, the patient is progressing in one or two sites and you can use localized radiation for that or you can have more systemic progression where you have to change uh, systemic therapy. We actually have some data, this is not awesome this is on first line um, EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors, trying to understand what can I expect if I decide to treat the patient post progression. This was a study called Aspiration Study, where the patients who have been progressing slowly on EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors were allowed to continue on EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors if they met a certain protocol specified criteria. And those criteria were very straightforward. Patients still have clinical benefit, they're not dramatically symptomatic. And basically, those patients who continued on EGFR TKI post first resist progression, we actually expect another three to four months before they start progressing more systemically, and then you'll have to change therapy. Um, that has also been covered, but I'll spend a little bit time on lack of benefit with monotherapy PD1 or PDL1 inhibitors in patients who develop resistance to EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors. This is a meta analysis published by Lee in JAMA Oncology, and you can see that patients who have an EGFR mutations, the benefit from um, PDL1 inhibitors is not really much different than um, benefit from chemotherapy. Um, just a reminder that major uh, clinical trial in immune oncology space uh, looking at using checkpoint inhibitors and first-line therapy either as a monotherapy or as a combination with chemotherapy did not include patients with EGFR mutations. So your 21G keynote, 21G keynote 189, checkmate 206, and keynote 024 did not allow patients who had an EGFR mutation. That study has been covered already. This is the only study that we have which allowed patients with EGFR sensitizing mutation who have failed all appropriate tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So this is kind of in your post-progression setting. Um, and there is some emerging data. Again, it's not yet, I agree with Dr. Agrawal, it's not yet good enough for me to change my practice, but it's good enough for me to start putting patients on the trials like that. And NCCN is actually going to run a trial exactly um, asking that question um, in a larger patient population. But so far with Empower 150, uh, we now see that quadruplet treatment, which is bevacizumab, atezolizumab, and platinum-based doublet was better than bevacizumab and platinum-based doublet for patients who've had um, EGFR or ALK mutation and have failed appropriately. EGFR targeted therapies. So this is your NCCN guidelines right now. If your patient is progressing on osimertinib, basically you divide those progression into asymptomatic and you can technically continue the um, drug if the progression is very slow. Then you can, if you have a brain progression, you radiate. And if you have a systemic progression, if it's an isolated lesion, um, you can radiate. If it's a more of a systemic progression, you should change therapy. I would recommend the post-progression biopsy uh, based on what we just discussed on a different uh, bypass track. Um, and you could use commercially available off-label medications if, let's say, your patient developed red mutation, or I would be very comfortable putting the patient on first-generation TKI if I used osimertinib upfront and I found a C797S mutation. 
So a couple of words about TATN. Uh, TATN has been uh, mentioned here before. TATN is an AstraZeneca study looking at the combination of osipertinib uh, plus MET inhibitor, savalitinib, in patients who have either uh, MET overexpression or MET amplification. This is the results of the study, the preliminary results of the study that you can see kind of I want you uh, Pay attention here. So this is a patient who have received prior third generation EGF tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and basically they progressed on osimertinib, and you add MET inhibitor, and you see a response rate of approximately 33%, so potentially viable option as well. So in summary, um, at the time of progression of EGF tyrosine kinase inhibitors, your patients should undergo molecular testing to select neck therapy. You could do blood-based testing, but again, remember that false negative negative rate, rate of a blood-based biopsy. Um, if your patient has a T790M mediated resistance, osimertinib is preferred to chemotherapy. Don't forget about small cell transformation. Um, you can predict um, you, the chances of your patient transforming into small cell if you have um, loss of p53 and rb1 and then post osimertinib progression treat based on the resistant mechanism and then i would recommend post progression biopsy and pay attention to c797s resistance